to disclose. And I think the session specific learning objectives were already shared uh, by email to you. So the topics that I would like to discuss today is first a brief introduction into the Doha agreement classification. Uh, it's basically formed the base for all the research that we have done uh, during the past three years. And I would also like to discuss if clinicians use the classification system in clinical practice. We tested the interrate reliability in a clinical setting in, uh, in Aspatar during the past years. Uh, and I also have a sneak peek of some results on specific clinical examination findings that can be useful to classify groin pain into the different entities of groin pain. The diagnosis of long-standing groin pain is known to be complex. It's a difficult anatomy. A lot of different anatomical structures can potentially cause, uh, uh, cause pain. We often don't know where the pain is starting or where the pain is coming from. And clinicians are using different terms for similar conditions, which adds to the complexity. And the letter was shown nicely in this study by uh, Adam Weir and colleagues, where a clinical case was presented to 23 groin experts from all over the world, and they were provided with extensive injury information on injury history, clinical examination findings and imaging findings, and they were asked to provide a diagnosis for this clinical case. And the 23 groin experts provided 22 different terms, and this showed the heterogeneous terminology problem that was going on in, uh, in long-standing groin pain. You can ask yourself, does it matter that we call the same problem a little bit different? Well, we think it matters, and the research shows us that it matters. This systematic re review found that if clinicians use more medicalized or precise terms, that clinicians are, are, are generally shifting towards more invasive management, and that there are higher anxiety ratings perceived by patients. So the words that we use have influence on, on, on patients and may influence uh, the management of uh, uh, of the diagnosis. In 2014, 24 groin experts came together in Doha in Aspatar to, uh, to tackle this issue of heterogeneous terminology, and they agreed on a standard classification system. This is that standard classification system, the Doha Agreement classification system, with the four defined clinical entities of groin pain, a doctor, in iliopsoas, inguinal, and pubic-related groin pain, and the hip and other causes for groin pain as the other two uh, potential classifications for groin pain. So the classification of the DOA agreement is mainly clinically, so it's based on patient history and clinical examination findings, where the clinical examination mainly exists of pain provocation tests. The exact diagnostic and prognostic value of imaging is not really clear along standing groin pain. A lot of imaging findings can be positive uh, on MRI, for example, but not related to the injury. And secondly, imaging is not really readily available for all clinicians. So uh, the, the experts wanted to have a straightforward, easy, applicable clinical classification system. So that's why they excluded imaging from, uh, from classifying uh, groin pain into the entities, although acknowledging that it may have a role, of course, especially for the hip, uh, for example. So during patient history, a uh, 4 history is, uh, is, is important. You have to discuss the onset in long-standing groin pain. Not all, uh, all injuries start gradually. In our cohort, for example, one in every four cases started with an acute onset, but became long-standing over time. Uh, asking for the location can provide important information, of course. But what we also found in our cohort is that one in every two athletes wasn't able to reproduce their pain by palpation, um, so by the athlete himself. So um, athletes are not always um, um uh, they don't always have um, the ability to show exactly where their uh, their pain is so sometimes they can only point at a region and all the other factors that you can see over here are important during your history taking for a diagnosis but also for management so as said the clinical examination mainly is based on uh, pain provocation tests during palpation stretch and resistance testing and during these tests, it's always important to ask for recognizable injury pain in the area that you want to test. And we'll show uh, a bit later why we think uh, this, is, uh, this is important. For example, for adductor-related groin pain, the definition is uh, uh, pain in the adductor area, which you can reproduce by palpation, uh, and pain in the adductors during resisted adduction testing. So if a patient uh, reports pain during these tests, we will classify it as adductor-related groin pain. 
And this diagnostic framework is a nice framework, I think, uh, to use in practice. And this study in itself is also a nice study if you want to have a one read study on an update of, uh, of the diagnosis and management of groin pain. It's a study by Christian Torborg and, uh, and, and colleagues, where also uh, a few of the hospital colleagues were part of, where they presented this simple framework. If an athlete presents with groin pain, you of course want to exclude uh, red flags, more serious pathology. You also want to exclude the lumbar spine or the SI joint. And then after your uh, clinical examination findings, you should be able to classify the groin pain according to the different entities of groin pain of the DOA agreement. And you can order appropriate imaging if you think that would help for your diagnosis, or maybe even more important, if you think it would help for your prognosis and for your management. So in summary for this part, the DOA agreement is a clinical classification system uh, where you can classify groin pain based on injury history and pain provocation tests. That was a brief introduction in, into the DOA agreement classification. Um, we wanted to learn actually how if clinicians use the classification system in clinical practice. The classification system was introduced in, in 2015, and we know that the, the study itself had a huge academic impact. It has been cited uh, over 300 times currently, but as I said, we didn't know if clinicians use the classification system in clinical practice and if they feel it could be improved. So we did this by performing a two round Delphi study among the original DOA agreement offer group. And we also performed an e-survey among clinicians working at the FIFA Medical Centers of Excellence and the IOC Research Centers. And we specifically asked the clinicians, of course, who regularly uh, uh, treat and assess athletes with longstanding groin pain. We first asked the original DOA agreement ex expert group if they have adopted the DOA agreement in different parts of their practice in their communication with patients, with colleagues, in research and in teaching. And what we found was that 73 to 82% reported to always or often use the classification system, but 9 to 18% reported to rarely or never use it. And the main reason by this last group for not using it was that, uh, uh, was that they feel the entity approach is not specific enough for them. We also asked the clinicians working at the FIFA and IOC centers if they use more generally, more generally, if they use a classification system in their clinical practice when assessing athletes with longstanding groin pain. It's good to highlight, I think, that the DOA agreement was not uh, the only classification system that appeared during the past 10 years. We also have the British consensus, consensus of the British uh, Hernia Society, and they mainly focused uh, on the inguinal canal area, and they proposed the term inguinal disruption. And we also have the Italian consensus uh, led by uh, Professor Biscotti, and they uh, uh, suggested the umbrella term groin pain syndrome, and they subdivided 63 potential causes of groin pain. We had 51 uh, responses from the clinicians of the FIFA and IOC centers, and 57% reported that they use the DOA agreement in clinical practice, 29% reported that they don't use any classification system, and the remaining 14% reported that they use a combination of different classification systems, of whom 12% also use the DOA agreement. So in total, 57% to 69% of clinicians that we investigated at least reported to use the DOA agreement classification in clinical practice. And we believe this is a, this is a good step forward and will hopefully help us to, uh, to be more homo homogeneous in, in, uh, in, in our terminology. What we also did during the study was that we replicated the 2015 Delphi study, which was performed as part of the DOA agreement process. So where clinical cases were presented to the experts or to the clinicians, and they were asked to provide uh, which terminology they would use for their most likely diagnosis. What was found in 2015 was that nine to 11 different terms were used for the most uh, likely diagnosis for each clinical case. And the DOA agreement terminology was used by 26 to 39% of clinicians. Our study among the same expert group, still eight to 11 different terms were used for the most likely diagnosis for each clinical case. Uh, but now the DOA agreement terminology was used by 50 to 67% of clinicians. The e-survey, so among the clinicians working at the FIFA and IOC centers, 12 to 15 different terms were used for the most likely diagnosis for each clinical case and the DOA agreement terminology was used by 43 
to 55% of clinicians. So in general, we can see, see a shift that uh, a small majority of clinicians are using the DOA agreement terminology also in a, in a more clinical setting, but we also still see that a lot of different, uh, different terms are being used for the diagnosis. And to just give a, a short example of this, this was a, a clinical case presented with, uh, with pain in the Ingenol Canal area, uh, provided with extensive information on injury history and clinical examination findings. And you can see over here all the primary diagnoses that were reported by the clinicians working at the FIFA and the IC centers. So you can see 15 different diagnostic terms. Ingenol related groin pain was the most used term. And interestingly, sports hernia or sportsman's hernia was the second most often used term. And the DOA agreement and also the British Hernia Society actually discouraged the ter this term because an actual hernia uh, is rarely present in athletes. So this probably will only cause confusion if we use this, uh, this term. So we were also interested to learn if there are any suggestions for improvement. So we asked the uh, original expert group in the, in the Delphi study if they have any suggestions for improvement for a potential DOA agreement 2.0. So in Delphi round one, they could provide their suggestions for improvement. So we had 49 suggestions in uh, uh, Delphi round one. Um, and in Delphi round two, they were able to uh, share if they agreed with the suggestions of their colleagues uh, of Delphi round one. So they could disagree, they could not have an opinion or they could, uh, could strongly agree. And we predefined for agreement a cutoff of, of 75%, which is generally used in, uh, in Delphi studies. But using this cutoff, we only found two statements that reached more than 75% agreement. We have five others that reached more than 75% disagreement, but only two statements that potentially could improve uh, the DOA agreement classification according to these experts. So one was more a recommendation for uh, research. The role of MRI findings need to be further clarified to improve the DOA agreement meaning classification. And the other one was that pubic st bone stress pubic stress fracture and pubic apophysitis should be differentiated since these diagnoses may provide clarification and have a different prognosis and management. So you can see based that only two out of the 49 suggestions reached agreement um, that there's not really a big foundation to, um, to agree on a DOA agreement 2.0. This was also not the aim of our study. We were more, inter more interested to learn do you, the opinions on a potential improvement and to quantify the level of agreement but we believe at this stage we need more original research to uh, provide these opinions and to uh, um, to have a more unified agreement on the, on these suggestions for improvement. So to summarize this part, the majority of clinicians are fortunately uh, starting to adopt the DOA agreement meaning classification in uh, clinical practice. So we believe this can improve our communication among colleagues to the patients, but it also would make it easier to uh, compare research findings. There is, however, still considerable heterogeneity in, um, in diagnostic terminology for the diagnosis of long-standing groin pain. And we need more original research to create a better foundation for our DOA agreement 2.0. As sportsman's hernia, we still hear it a lot, but we don't recommend this term. The DOA agreement doesn't recommend it, and the British Hernia Society also doesn't recommend uh, the use of this term. So um, the next thing we were interested to learn was how reliable is the classification system in a clinical setting, because this has not been uh, investigated yet. So we did this during the past years at, uh, at Ospitar. We included four, 48 athletes uh, with long-standing groin pain, of whom 18 had uh, bilateral symptoms, and they were assessed in a blinded manner by Dr. Zarko Vukovic here on the left uh, and uh, Andrea Cerner here on the right. So they performed their history taking and standardized clinical examination. They were blinded for imaging findings and any other information. And after their history taking and clinical examination, they were asked to classify the groin pain according to the DOA agreement. Sometimes it could be a single entity for groin pain, but sometimes groin pain also presents with mul multiple entities. Uh, and in these cases, the experts and the clinicians were asked to uh, classify the groin pain. So they were asked to make a primary diagnosis uh, and also to make a more secondary no diagnosis or more secondary symptoms according to the DOA agreement classification. 
So if we look at the prevalence of the clinical entities in our cohort, we found adductor, inguinal and eosinophils related groin pain to be the most uh, common entities. Inguinal related groin pain is a bit uh, higher than what you would see or expect in the general clinic or at your football club. And that's probably mainly because most uh, patients were recruited from, uh, from the clinic from uh, uh, Dr. Zarko. So that's uh, probably why the inguinal related groin pain is a bit overrepresented than what you would expect. We also see an average of three entities uh, per athlete with long-standing groin pain. This is also a bit more than what you would see in a general clinic. And that's probably also because uh, uh, the bit more complex cases of, of long-standing groin pain would probably uh, come to, uh, to Dr. Zarko. So if we look at the uh, interactive reliability, we see uh, here on the left, we see all the different uh, entities of the uh, DOA agreement. This column, you can see the kappa value and the kappa value for those who are not familiar with it is basically an agreement statistic that adjusts for chance agreement. So a kappa value of zero is basically that the interrater agreement is mainly based on chance. So you could also flip a coin and the closer it shifts to one, the better the interrater uh, agreement is with a kappa value of one being uh, the perfect uh, interrater agreement. In this column, you can see the Kappa interpretation. This is based on the Landis and Koch scale, which is often used in, in research. And on the right, which is a bit easier for interpretation, is the overall agreement, which basically says how often does examiner A agree with examiner B. So you can see that the Kappa values differ a bit between uh, the different entities of groin pain and the difference between slight to uh, substantial agreement for the different entities. If we look at the most Prevalent entities, a doctor, inguinal and eopsos related groin pain, you can see it varies from fair to moderate agreement. And if you see the overall agreement, the 70, uh, 73% for a doctor related groin pain basically means that in one in every four cases, approximately both examiners agreed that a doctor related groin pain was present or not. And for inguinal and eopsos related groin pain, in four in out of every five cases, they agreed that there was inguinal or eopsos related groin pain present or not. Also in one in every four or one in every five cases, they did not agree. And it's also showed that even with an easy applicable clinical classification system and experienced clinicians, uh, how difficult uh, the diagnosis of, of longstanding groin pain is. We also checked if uh, the classification system that I just mentioned, so differentiating between a primary, primary diagnosis or primary entity and more secondary diagnosis or entities, would improve the classification system and it definitely improved for the most prevalent uh, entities. So for adductor, inguinal and ellipsoas related groin pain, you can see that it shifts to uh, moderate to substantial agreement. It stayed, however, the same for pubic related groin pain and it decreased a bit for hip and other causes for groin pain. So we don't know if this uh, if this like differentiation would help us in a clinic. You could imagine that the primary diagnosis is 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 the most important one to target your treatment for but we don't have any evidence to to support this at, the, at this stage we also looked at a bit easier cases in our cohort so the athletes only presenting with one pain location or one clinical entity of groin pain and these were eight out of the 48 uh, included athletes and for these eight athletes there was 100 percent agreement among examiners so uh athletes presenting only with a single entity of groin pain uh, resulted in 100% agreement between the two examiners. And if athletes present with multiple entities of groin pain, the agreement reduces and the integrated reliability reduces. So especially for these more difficult cases presenting with multiple entities or with bilateral groin pain, I would definitely recommend to do a multidisciplinary assessment. So to have the different disciplines involved general surgeon, physiotherapist, radiologist, sports medicine physician, and uh, potentially also uh, an orthopedic surgeon if, if the hip may be involved to, uh, uh, to make an optimal uh, uh, treatment plan and also to reduce uh, the uncertainty between different examiners if they would examine the patient at separate moments. And uh, especially for these difficult cases, I think it's also good to not only focus on history, clinical examination findings and imaging findings, but to also look at functional deficits and, and potential strength deficits, which can help you to make, uh, uh, make an appropriate management plan. So that was basically the, the, uh, the reliability of the DOA agreement classification.
we also wanted to look further into the specific clinical examination tests. So which clinical examination tests are most reliable and which clinical examination tests help us most to classify groin pain according to the DOA agreement. And these are really uh, recent results. So um, we just analyzed them. So I just have a sneak, a sneak peek for you of uh, some preliminary results for uh, a doctor and for inguinal related groin pain. So for this project, we have included uh, 44 athletes of whom uh, 17 had bilateral uh, long-standing groin pain. So we had 61 symptomatic sites, uh, but we investigated all sites, so also the asymptomatic sites. So in total, uh, 88 groins were uh, assessed in a standardized manner by uh, Dr. Zarka Vukovic again and by uh, Andrea Cerner. So if we look back again at a doctor-related groin pain, as already mentioned, uh, important during clinical examination is a doctor palpation where the athlete has to report recognizable injury pain and during uh, resisted adduction the athlete has to report recognizable injury pain in the adductors. And why is it so important to ask for recognizable injury pain and why is it important to ask for the injury location during your resistance or stretch testing? This is for example the adductor palpation test that we have performed. So we palpated the adductor longus origin, the tendon yeah, and the adductor longus muscle, the gracilis, pectineus and the adductor magnus. And in the first column over here, you, see, you can see uh, how often in all the 88 uh, sites, how often athletes reported recognizable injury pain. In the second column, you can see how often athletes reported pain during palpation, but it was not related to their injury. So especially, for example, for the adductor longus origin, you can see that almost one in every 10 cases, the athletes may report uh, a pain when you're palpating the adductor longus uh, origin at the pubic bone, but it's not related to their injury. And especially for the pectineus, um, it's 60%. So in almost, um, yeah, one in every, uh, 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 yeah, three cases, almost one in one every, sorry, one in every uh, six two cases, almost one in every five cases, the athlete may, re may report pain during palpation of the pectineus, but it's not related to their injury. So we think this is very important because you can easily overclassify a doctor related groin pain or you can order unnecessary imaging if you uh, don't clearly ask for a recognizable injury pain during your palpation tests. For the stretch and resistance test, we performed an adductor stretch test. We performed uh, an adductor resistance in maximum abduction of the hip and the squeeze tests in, in zero degrees hip flexion, 45 degrees hip flexion and 90 degrees hip flexion. And over here you can see the areas where the athlete reported recognizable injury pain for the different tests. So they could be in the adductors, in the inguinal canal area, ellipsos area, pubic uh, bone area um, or any other area or not related to their, uh, their injury. And what you can see is that especially a lot of uh, adductor stretch and resistance tests are often positive for the inguinal canal area as well. Um, and this highlights the, the, the close interconnectivity between the adductors and the lower abdominal area. But it also shows us, shows us how careful we have to be with our interpretation of, for example, in this case, the adductor stretch and resistance test. If we do, for example, the, the squeeze test in zero degrees hip flexion, which I believe is the most commonly used uh, test in clinical practice to uh, to test resisted adduction. You can see that in half of the cases it's, it's positive for adductor uh, related groin pain, but also in half of the cases uh, it's positive for the inguinal canal. So these are not percentages, these are absolute values. So in this regard, the squeeze test in 45 degrees is a bit more sensitive to exclude the uh, the inguinal canal area and to more focus on the uh, on the adductors. So um, yeah, we believe this shows also the importance of asking for the injury uh, injury location when doing the uh, stretch and resistance testing uh, in long-standing groin pain. So what are the most common pain locations in, uh, in athletes with adductor-related groin pain? The adductor longus is the most often involved uh, muscle, as uh, most of you will probably know. And what we found in our cohort is that most athletes report pain at the adductor longus origin. So that's 69% of the athletes with long-standing adductor-related groin pain. Uh, 
a bit more often 30% in, uh, in the tendon, which we quantified as the first two centimeters from the pubic bone. And a bit further in the muscle, it's only 19%. And the agreement value that you see above it is the interrater agreement that we found for this, uh, this test if we use it as a pain provocation test. Also, the pectineus is quite often uh, uh, painful and, and, and giving recognizable injury pain for patients. So in 46% of the case, cases with uh, doctor related groin pain, uh, the pectineus is also, uh, is also uh, painful, but we only found slight interrater agreement uh, for palpating the pectineus as a pain provocation test, potentially because quite often uh, the athlete may report uh, pain, which is not um, related to their injury, what we already just uh, what we already just saw. If we look at the different adductor stretch and resistance tests uh, and, uh, and the agreement values, we found moderate to substantial agreement for uh, the different stretch and, uh, and resistance tests. So they are all quite useful in, uh, in, in clinical practice. The most reliable test that we found is the adduction in maximum abduction. So what you can see here on the bottom picture, you bring the leg of the, of, of the athlete to maximum abduction, and then you ask the athlete to, athlete to perform a resisted uh, isometric adduction uh, yeah, to the leg of you as, uh, as the examiner. However, if we look how often these tests are uh, positive in athletes with adductor related groin pain, you can see that it differs a lot. Um, so the stretch test is only uh, positive in 37% of the athletes with adductor related groin pain, and the different um, resistance tests are only positive uh, for 36 to 30 to 53 percent of uh, uh, of athletes with adductor related groin pain. So we don't unfortunately have a single perfect test, although this test is the most reliable test. It doesn't give you all information because it, it's only positive in one in every two athletes with adductor related groin pain. So it probably stays important to do the battery of tests, but it's important to uh, to realize uh, that, for example, the most reliable test is this test that we see over here. Uh, and for the squeeze test, what we already saw in zero degrees, that is quite often painful in the inguinal canal area as well. If we move to inguinal related groin pain, uh, which is known as, as the most difficult area of, uh, uh, of long-standing groin pain, there are a lot of different theories going on on, on what may cause uh, the pain in, uh, in the inguinal canal area. And we recently submitted a, a nice editorial on these different theories, which was led by uh, Dr. Zarko Vukovic. So I'd like to kindly ask you to not uh, to not share this uh, this picture at this moment, which was uh, beautifully uh, drawn by uh, by Vicky Earl. And I just want to highlight one theory, the theory of uh, the posterior wall bulge that we see over here on one, because it's, this is one of the most uh, common theories in uh, in inguinal related groin pain. And the theory is basically that a weakness in the uh, posterior wall area can potentially cause bulging during uh, increased intra-abdominal pressure, and this bulge may compress. For example, the nerves, as you can see over here, explaining the, uh, the pain of the patient. So inguinal related groin pain was defined in the DOA agreement as a pain location in the inguinal canal region and tenderness of the inguinal canal. There should be no palpable inguinal hernia present because if that would be the case, it would be classified as other causes for groin pain according to the DOA agreement. And the classification is more likely if there's a recognizable injury pain in the inguinal area during a resisted abdominal testing and during Valsalva, cough or sneeze. So the clinical examination for inguinal related groin pain is mainly based on uh, palpation and abdominal resistance testing. And palpation, we normally do it uh, with and uh, uh, without uh, inguinal invagination. So inguinal invagination here on the bottom picture and uh, just palpating the abdominal wall in the top picture and normally during palpation of the abdominal abdominal wall we're palpating the pubic tubercle the insertion of the inguinal ligament the blue line that you see over here uh, and just above it on the lateral side of the rectus abdominis the insertion of the of the conjoint tendon uh, and if we use that palpation tests uh, uh, as pain provocation tests we found substantial agreement for palpation of the abdominal wall without inguinal invagination and during inguinal invagination, uh, we found a moderate interrater agreement. And we also checked if, if we try to be more specific, if it would improve the interrater reliability. Uh, 
but um, if we try to be more specific, so only on the pubic tubercle and only on the inguinal ligament, uh, we found that the interator reliability is uh, decreasing. Especially during inguinal navigation, it's um, very important again to ask for recognizable injury pain because in one in every four cases, uh, athletes report pain, but it's not related to their injury because it's just uh, not a, a comfortable test for, uh, for the male athletes. So what are the pain locations in, in athletes with uh, inguinal related groin pain? Without inguinal invagination, 49% of the athletes report uh, recognizable injury pain at the conjoint tendon or at the inguinal ligament insertion. 56% report pain uh, at the pubic tubercle. And in total, 64% uh, of the athletes with inguinal related groin pain report any palpation pain uh, of the abdominal wall without uh, invagination of the inguinal canal. During invagination, the external ring is uh, painful in 46% in of, uh, of patients and during palpation of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal and then asking uh, the athlete to perform, perform a Valsalva maneuver, so to blow on the, on the backside of their hand, 66% uh, of the athletes report recognizable injury pain. In total, during invagination of the inguinal canal, 78% of the athletes report recognizable injury pain, and that's only in the patients with, with inguinal related groin pain. Uh, and that's, that's in itself not a surprising number because, because it's considered one of the main findings to classify uh, athletes with inguinal related groin pain. If we look at uh, the posterior wall structure and the bulging that I just uh, introduced, uh, we also asked the examiners if they could quantify the structure of the posterior wall, so being firm or soft, and during the Valsalva maneuver of the patient, if they could assess uh, bulging clinically, yes or no. And we found kappa values of uh, fair to slight. So uh, as just mentioned, a kappa of, uh, of 0 0.01 uh, is basically a flip a coin. So this is probably not really valuable in our, in our clinical practice, or at least the interrater reliability is, is not really high. And for the bulging, uh, the kappa value is, uh, is, is fair. So also not really high. So potentially uh, this clinical finding is, is a bit limited, although the theory is, is very plausible. Often during surgery, these, these cases are improving by reinforcing the posterior wall. So uh, we only have to realize that using it as a clinical test, that there's quite some variation between uh, two experienced blinding, blinded assessors uh, examining the patients. A short sidestep to ultrasound where this bulging of the posterior wall is also often assessed. Uh, the diagnostic utility of this bulging is also an area of debate. In, uh, in a study from uh, Phil Robinson and colleagues, which was published in 2015, 65% uh, of bulging uh, in 65% of football players, uh, bulging was found as well. And only in 55% of sy symptomatic football players, uh, uh, bulging was found. So it's almost as often. Um, uh, uh, prevalent in, in asymptomatic football players as it is in symptomatic football players. And what adds to the complexity is that we don't have any interrater reliability uh, data available. So we don't know if different radiologists would assess the inguinal canal of a football player, if they would agree on the finding bulging or not. So again, theory is the theory is, is very plausible behind it, but the diagnostic uh, utility is, uh, is quite limited based on current uh, research. We also looked at um, the abdominal resistance test. So we looked at six different tests, the uh, straight sit up in zero degrees and in 45 degrees, and the cross test, which is basically uh, an oblique sit up where uh, simultaneously the athlete is, report of, is asked to perform a resisted hip flexion on the contralateral hip. So what you can see on the picture over here, uh, and also the oblique sit ups with uh, in 45 degrees hip flexion. And we found a fair to substantial Interrater reliability for these clinical examination tests, where especially the straight sit ups and the cross tests were most reliable. But again, if we look at the prevalence of positive tests, so how often are these tests positive in athletes with inguinal related groin pain, you see that varies even more than for the adductors. So that varies between 20 to 48 percent of, uh, of the athletes. The most uh, prevalent test in, in, uh, uh, in athletes with inguinal related groin pain is the cross test where you use the contralateral shoulder, but we have to realize that it only will be positive in uh, one in every two 
athletes with uh, with inguinal ligament pain. So also for for this, there is no perfect test. We probably still have to do a combination of different tests, but it's definitely uh, good and important based on current research to include a cross test. How does this test work? If an if an athlete presents with uh, pain in the right groin and especially in the right lower abdominal area, uh, you perform resistance on on the left shoulder of the athlete, and the athlete tries to make an oblique sit up, and also simultaneously makes a resistant hip flexion with the contralateral hip, so on the right side in this case. And it, if the athlete reports recognizable injury pain in the right inguinal canal area, um, uh, it would help us to uh, uh, to score this test positive and potentially help us to classify groin pain um, according to the, uh, the agreement for uh, for the inguinal canal. So in summary for uh, for this part, the most pain provocation tests have a moderate to substantial uh, agreement, so can be definitely useful in uh, in, in clinical practice, although having, uh, of course, also their minor uh, limitations. And there is no perfect test. Although the different tests uh, have different usefulness, some are a bit more reliable, some are uh, just more prevalent and more useful to classify uh, according to the DOA agreement. But we don't have one perfect test to help us only for a doctor-related growing pain. So uh, the combination of the different tests and a careful interpretation together with injury history, potential imaging findings, uh, and also to look at functional and strength deficits will all just be pieces of, uh, of the puzzle. So as take home, um, the DOA agreement classification has been adopted by the majority of clinicians. And as said, we believe it will help us to improve our communication among each other to patients and, uh, and also to make it easier to compare research findings. The classification system is very reliable when athletes only present with a single entity of groin pain or with one pain location, but the reliability is decreasing a bit when athletes present with multiple entities or with bilateral uh, uh, symptoms. And in these difficult cases, that cases uh, a multidisciplinary approach can definitely be, uh, be recommended. And during your clinical examination, uh, always ask for recognizable injury pain, especially during your palpation tests, and always ask for a pain location during your resistance and stretch testing. And we have this nice uh, clinical examination pictorial that we made already before starting the study to uh, standardize all the clinical examination tests with clear descriptions. And if you'd be uh, interested to have these, uh, this, uh, uh, this pictorial, please feel free to send me an email or to send uh, uh, Andreas or Dr. Zarko an email, and we will be happy to, uh, to share this uh, pictorial, of course. And we also have still some uh, future 